Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, it's Whitney Allen. Hi. Hi. By the way, I forgot to mention it because we I have not done a ton of in-person episodes sure. lately. We're getting back into it. I think my camera's a little bit not level now that I'm looking at it. I'm not going to worry it's about it. It's my height, so it's all good. It's uh, Don't worry about playing to the camera. We're having, let's just talk. Okay. We can cheat out a little bit if we want, but it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> yeah, These are my things that I'm like, normally I would be like, oh, yeah, let's get that out. But you know what? We're going to pull back the curtain today. Cool. I like it's all that. good. Um, it is very nice to have you. You are currently visiting from New York here for a brief uh, fleeting, what, five days? Yeah, roughly? pretty much five days. But we have done, uh, we, we've flown in the same circles with the pack theater and whiz world live and uh you were a guest before i even knew who you were you you were a call-in guest on discomfort zone did you get the prize i sent you yes i did and i forgot to bring it back and wear it with me that was like (laughs) one of the sentimental things what was the prize it was one of your black polo shirts that's right the black (laughs) polo shirt i got that yeah from when i was uh, when i still auditioned for commercials all the time yes oh yeah man now i feel bad i should have knew i forgot something that would have been an inside joke for literally just the the people who watch this on youtube which hey it could be 11 people right it could be um, it's very, uh, it's a very good to have you in person though, and not know you as just Waddles Barkley on the internet. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just thinking back to that episode. <laughs> oh my God. This is a great time. You, uh, you played your part very well. You were the kind of caller, the discomfort zone for anyone who wasn't paying attention back in the spring, summer, fall, winter, whatever season it was. It was COVID. It was COVID, the COVID season. COVID season. Um, when I had this po- this game show on Twitch, it was just people telling embarrassing stories. But it was entirely done by improvisers and people who I knew who were funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and you called in a, a day that I didn't have anybody. And I can, I had, did I have to convince you to call in? Because you, char- you were in characters being ex- extremely embarrassed about what had happened? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you want Great. me to tell more of this? Briefly. Story? Hit it in. Because bef- right. I would rather <laughs> talk about this than the, the joyless, soul-sucking, horrifying uh, garbage fest that was oh, the cat in the hat. My- God. Yeah. So we'll, we'll dive into the discomfort zone call. And so when I called in, I pretty much was a character who was getting ready for a cosplay and she Uh specifically wanted to be a cosplay for a, um, some sort of Magic the Gathering or Dungeons and Dragons. I think it was a Magic the Gathering character. Yeah. There was a, there was a specific character. I don't remember the name and she's gorgeous, curly hair, uh, the thing was, my character is white, and um, the character that she wanted to cosplay was black. Yeah. So she wanted to do blackface. For cosplay this blackface. <laughs> it was pretty great. Um, uh, an all-time great episode of oh this nine-episode limited series, The Discomfort Zone, hosted by Jay Light. But now, you're not Waddles Barkley or Whitney Allen, and you yes. came to me wanting to talk about a movie that I have somehow managed to avoid all this time. And I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, <laughs> I think this is long overdue, frankly. It is mm-hmm. 2003's The Cat in the Hat. Like, you know, when I reached out, I was very surprised that no one did an episode about this. Me too. It's uh, shocking. Yeah, like of all the options. Like, I understood, like, Masters of Disguise. I understood, like, actually, the other one I, I think I mentioned wasn't done yet. Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. Yeah, but that had not been done, no. Not been done yet. But, but this was just, like, a classic bad movie, oh. I think. Yeah, like, I felt so bad. His name's Ben, right? I felt so bad for Ben because when I was Uh like calling him, I just felt like I was going through a seizure (laughs) just trying to explain how bad and uncomfortable this movie was. Shout out to my producer, uh, Ben Rosen, a a former guest and wonderful, wonderful producer. Very fantastic. Uh, Thank you for your patience for that. But essentially, like, 
I think like the more I thought about it, the more, the best way I can explain to people is that it was just a dumpster fire of just crude humor. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very predictable approach just because it's like a lot of the reviews were like, oh wow, these jokes are really bad. Here's the thing though. When I was a kid, I loved the movie. Okay. But here's the thing. I grew up. <laughs> I grew up as an actual thinking human being. Right. Um, and there was a moment in my life where I was like, all right, let's. I was really big into like Masters of Disguise. And so I watched that. Uh huh. And that did not age well. And I was like, well, if this is true, what else is true? Right. And, and it led me to Cat in the Hat. And now you're Cat in the Hat. Cat in the Hat being a movie um, that has a surprisingly stacked set of people behind it yeah. in terms of like it's got three of the greatest comedy writers of all time writing the script Alec Berg David Mandel and Jeff Schaefer yeah. who wrote on Seinfeld Jeff Schaefer helped uh, co-create stuff like The League uh, he has uh, been EP on Curb Your Enthusiasm he helped create Dave Alec Berg is one of the creators of Barry mm -hmm. you've got uh, uh, Brian Grazer and Imagine Productions so that's Ron Howard's production company and you have the biggest surprise of them all for me is motherfucking Emmanuel Lubezki Chivo one of the greatest cinematographers in modern times doing the cinematography for this movie yeah. this movie is however unfortunately hot hot steamy garbage very hot steamy diarrhea garbage yes it's just oh it's really bad it <sighs> is inexplicably horny for a children's movie. Very. There's a lot of, there's a lot of jokes about how horny the cat is. Yes. Even though the cat is both spayed and neutered, which does also doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make sense. It's one of those children's movies that falls into the classic children's movie trap of being a movie that is so clearly trying too hard to be a movie that adults can watch with their kids. Mm hmm. And that's a big problem. Is that what you watch, how you watched it the first time? You watched it with your parents? Uh, I think I watched it by myself. You Otherwise, watched it by yourself. Here's the thing. Even I, better. <laughs> I think that's part of the reason why I was able to watch so watch The Cat in the Hat so many times as a kid is because I don't think my parents knew. Uh -huh. And I didn't really know as well either. Like, especially the dirty hoe joke. Like, I didn't fully understand. Right, of course. <laughs> For That's a joke that no <laughs> child is going to get. That's not a joke for children. That is not a joke for children. Like, I think when I was a kid, like, you see, like, the cat in a hat just about to make out with the hoe. But I think as a kid, I thought, oh, he's just trying to lick off shit on it. Right, he's also, trying to get the dirt off. Yeah, yeah, like, crude humor, that type of crude humor, but not, like, explicitly sexual. Uh-huh. Um... But yeah, going back to the people who are part of it, like, I think, I think that's part of the reason why it didn't do so well. I think those are like the writers who focus on more adult stuff. Right. Um, actually, what I was looking up to, it turned out a lot of the dialogue was supposed to be in The Grinch, but Ron Howard's actually really? took it out. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> what dialogue? I think a lot of the crude humor stuff. Okay. Um, and they got rid of it. From the Grinch. Yeah. And just repurposed it for this. Wait, was it written by the same guys? I, I double check, but I feel like it's a similar cast of people. Um, I, I think even just the environment between the Grinch and Cat in the Hat, it's very similar. How the Grinch stole Christmas. Yeah. Different cast. Okay. Different writers. But oh, it's still from Imagine. So maybe they had some of the production was the same. Maybe they'd originally written like a draft. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Ooh. Now I see it. All right. So DreamWorks acquired the rights to the original uh, Cat in the Hat in 1997. Yes. But they didn't start production until after How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, first were like, all right, we're going to make this happen uh, now that we have a chance to make two of the greatest children's books of all time happen at once. And by the way, I will say, I think the Grinch adaptation, solid. Still holds up. I fun. agree. Because it's a, a family movie. It's also whimsical. Mm -hmm. this, it, is, yeah. this is not whimsical. <laughs> this is annoying. 
This is annoying, Whitney. Oh my God. And I feel so bad for you to make you watch that. Cause I was, I think after we talked about it, I was like, oh, have you seen the movie? And you're like, nope. And I'm like, I am so sorry. You're going to have to go through all oh that. Oh my God. Okay. So you watched this for the first time when you were a child yes. by yourself, a bunch. Yes. And your parents don't know ever about you watching it. Yes. So how did you come to a, a, having this moment where you like, have have rewatched a movie from your childhood already, mm-hmm. Master of Disguise, and found it doesn't hold up. Yeah. So now you're here again. You're like, oh, well, do I really want to dip my toes into that water? Like, why did you take the leap and go back into the cat in the hat, even though you almost certainly knew it was not going to be good and it wasn't going to hold up? Part of me, because I, I come from like a comedy background now, and it's uh-huh. like, I wonder if any of those jokes would land. Or is this just... <sighs> I don't know. I feel like I've seen a lot of people be like, this is a joke. This is how it's written up. And here it is. Uh, but I realized that movie was just at best white bro comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a, uh, this is definitely a couple of white bros who are writing this movie, a, mm-hmm. a trio of them, a if trio. you will. <laughs> and I think, you know, speak to that a little bit more, you know, cause they're definitely like, they're trying to do the sort of like white guy bro humor thing of like just being, you know, you're being, uh, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of horny cat jokes, a very sexual, very dirty for a kid's movie. Mm-hmm. It's pushed, about as far the line is pushed you can get in a kid's movie right. and still pull off being PG, PG not even PG-13. That also boggles my mind. Like, how did you make a PG? Like, mm-hmm. I understand, I think... If it was PG-13, it probably would not have hit as hard. But I think there must have been countless experiences of parents being like, oh, cat in the hat. And the kids go in and see it. And the parents are like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, our childhood is ruined. Right. But, and, our, and our child's childhood is ruined. Because, yeah. And I think to part of that, too, it's like I remember the book as a kid. Of course, mm-hmm. I'm sure you do, too. Yeah. There's, as you do with ad, uh, an adaptation of a book. Yep. There's a lot of changing and padding out that you have to do, right? For this, you're turning a, what is it, maybe a 50-page book into an hour and a half long movie. Mm-hmm. Of course you have to pad some stuff out. You have to flesh out and give some people some motivation. Yep. But a lot of the stuff that the characters do, I think a lot of the choices that are made, besides the choices of uh, Conrad and Sally, the kids, yes. who in another classic children's movie move, Their characters are specifically labeled as like what they are, which is Conrad is bad and, and is not, and like doesn't have his shit together. And Sally is overly cautious and overly scheduling, which a child is not supposed to be. Yeah. All of that stuff, you hit it on the head, you do that right thing. But all of the rest of your characters in this movie, their motivations are flimsy, non-existent in some cases. Yeah. Just being weird for the sake of being weird. Yeah. Like, the Alec Baldwin character obviously is, like, one of the weird ones. Yeah. It's just, like, he's working so hard to essentially fuck his mom. Or not, wait. Fuck Conrad's mom. Thank you. He's not trying to fuck his own mom. His own mom does not appear in this movie. Yeah. We're not, yes. He wants to fuck Kelly Preston, who <laughs> shows you. up as a kid's mom. Did Alec Baldwin marry Kelly Preston at some point? Weren't they together? Oh, shit. I don't know. I think they were. Must be. I think maybe this is, if this was the movie where they met, I would be horrified. Oh my god! Yeah, what an acid trip of an experience. Yeah, this is a real insane movie to meet on. Um, let's see what we got here. Where are you, Kelly Preston? Kelly. 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 Kelly and Alec Baldwin. No, Kelly was married. Kelly has been married to John Travolta for years. So I got that completely wrong. That's why did I get that totally wrong? That name ringed a bell. I think John Travolta and Alec Baldwin, I think, are kind of within the same like. Uh, era of entertainment. And this so. is also, this might have been the reason why Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger got divorced. Because this movie was being made, they they got divorced in 2002. This movie was made and released in 2003, so that means it was probably made in 2002. Oh <laughs> Sorry, that's a that's a, a surreal concept. Hey-o. If that was the case, like Cat in the Hat caused divorces <laughs> among these actors. No one was enjoying their time in this movie. Clearly, no. You told me, the, you were talking about some stories you heard during production about like Mike Myers really having a big problem with yeah, it. Yeah, he had huge problems. He didn't want to be Cat in the Hat. Uh, it, 
Turns out, I think he he was obligated to play the role of Cat in the Hat, even though he okay. claimed that it was his first book he read. He loved it, blah, blah, blah. But he was having issues with um, Imagine, uh, the that company. And pretty much there were some lawsuits going back and forth. So it was just a very sticky situation where he was like, all right, I guess I have to play Cat in the Hat. I guess I'm the fucking Cat in the Hat. <laughs> I guess I'm- all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. And by the way, I'll say this to Mike Myers' credit. Mike Myers is doing about as good of a job as he can to play the cat in the hat, writing aside. <sighs> uh, uh, but what that means is he's just doing impressions of cartoon cats. Right. He's like Pink Panther, Snagglepuss, and uh, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, not Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> just Sylvester the cat. Yeah. Not Sylvester. So he's not fucking Adrian. <laughs> but all of the cat, he's all of the cartoon cats rolled yeah. into one. Actually, a well, part of me was like, I also didn't really like his rendition of it. Um, like just his action, his movement, like the way he walked. Mm-hmm. God, that irritates me. Yeah, it's really irritating. Like that's not even like I don't even know what he's trying to do. Like not even I don't think a cat would even walk like that. But why am I saying that? Because cats don't walk on two legs; they walk on four legs. So mm-hmm. you see the problem with me trying yeah. to explain how horrific this movie is. You can't really uh, analyze this movie in a normal way. You because it's not a no- it's about as far from a normal movie as you can get. I think that's part of the reason why I never did drugs as a kid i, I mean that- i didn't do drugs as a kid either i didn't start <laughs> doing drugs until i was at least close to legal adult yes um, i hope nobody did drugs as a kid who's listening to this but if you did tell us if the cat in the hat was good Play yeah twice you know what that would be a different perspective then this is a dr- this is a movie that like i feel like i would be terrified of while i watched it on drugs though. right like i wouldn't want to watch this movie sober again and i also wouldn't want to watch this movie on drugs like oh, this is yeah. the kind of this is the kind of movie that I feel like you would think t- to watch on an acid trip and then you watch it and then you never do drugs ever again. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's, oh. it's bad. It's, uh, I, I don't really know even like <laughs> there's so many problems with the movie, but I don't know where it really falls apart the most. Like it's, it, it, the characters obviously are bad. I think like mm-hmm. right at the very, I was, I was really thrown out right at the very beginning with Sean Hayes's character. Yeah. Sean Hayes, who is again, just being a weird guy. Mm-hmm. That's his entire character trait. He's, he's like a weird clean freak. Yeah. And that's not enough of a comedy thing to hit the way he hits it. Like he's hitting it where he's also like overly enunciating everything and talking like this mm-hmm. and just saying things very loud and repeating himself. And it's weird. Yeah. And it's but it's not funny. I think part of it's because he had to split roles between that character and the fish. And they, He's the fish? He is the fish. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, he's, I never cared about that's I usually care about who plays what in this movie. I didn't even give a fuck about who played the no, fish. No, and the fish only had like maybe four lines or something. Yeah, it's he's just, not even a he just only shows up a little bit. He's initially just a goldfish in a bowl, like a regular one, and then they do this horrible CGI shit Yeah, that looks even more unnatural than a lot of the rest of the movie, which, by the way, this movie, not anywhere close to real looking, which is fine. It's a storybook. It's a cartoon. It's a whole, the whole big plot line of the movie is that they have this crate opened to an interdimensional universe that is making a cartoon out of their house. But even that, it just like, the cartoon logic of this movie really boggles my fucking mind, right. Whitney. You know it's bad when the widow of Dr. Seuss is like, this movie is so horrific. I do not want anybody reenacting my husband's books ever again. Yeah, the reception to this movie is so bad. Oh my God. It got a, a ton of... Really, you know, got a lot of nominations at the Razzie Awards. <laughs> it was uh, disappointed. Alec Baldwin was disappointed with the film. He addressed complaints he received because his dissimilarity to the source material. Mm-hmm. Um, Leonard Malton says that it is uh, one and a half stars. Uh, the, saying the film's official title, which included Dr. Seuss, is an official insult to the Seuss family. <laughs> yeah. As That's is correct. Like, 
This movie, they made a video game based on this. Oh, and did you yeah. ever play that? Did you play I that a lot? I didn't play it. I just know it. And yeah, if you, I'll give the video game credit. I think the video game's even worse mm-hmm. than the movie. That's uh, that's that's tough to do. Yeah, it's very tough to do. I really do think it is crazy that like the widow of Doctor Seuss saw this movie and banned live action adaptations of his work from ever happening ever again. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause I also don't think I'm trying to think really hard right now of what a Dr. Seuss live action movie that could work is. And I don't think there is one. I don't think there's, I don't think there is one. I think Aunt, uh, Audrey Geisel did us all a favor by making sure that we don't ever have to see one. We don't ever have to have somebody try and come up with a way to try and film like the Lorax in live action. Oh yeah. Or the Sneeches in live action. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. Like I was initially gonna say, like, I mean the Grinch was good, but I think when it's like an like a real a realistic adaptation, mm-hmm. um, you kind of get yourself away from the imagination. Like, oh, if this is set in reality, then there are limitations to it. Versus like animation where it's like the opportunities are endless. Right. You can have a character go into a rocket ship and fly off within seconds. Like it makes sense for that environment. Like when you're in a physical environment, like the Grinch and cat in the hat, it's like, it's so hard to, Mm -hmm. it's, it's very jarring to like make your brain match up and be like, wait, right. But I think the only way you could do it is you would have to have the right director to make the vision come to life. And I also think that that might, depending on who it is, Mm -hmm. that would mean possibly pushing the boundary and making it um, maybe a little scary. Like, I think the people who come to mind, two people who come to mind who I think could do a good live action Dr. Seuss, David Lynch. Okay. And Guillermo, uh, Guillermo de, blah, why can't I say his <laughs> fucking name, Whitney? I don't Guillermo know. del Toro. There we go. Del Toro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Guillermo del Tomo. Um, no, I think that uh, that both of them could do it. And also Guillermo del Toro and Chivo uh, collab. That would be great. Mm-hmm. I would love to see those two working together. I don't know if, I'm sure that they probably have worked together on some things Must before. Be. Yeah. But like a David Lynch version of like Horton Hears a Who as uh, as a companion piece to the Elephant Man. Oh. I know, right? Whoa. Maybe good. Like I'm gonna i st- I'm gonna start reading through a list of some of the classic Dr. Seuss novels books. And I just want you to say maybe this would be a good director yeah. for this movie. Would you would you watch the Guillermo del Toro adaptation of the Lorax? Because I know I would. I think so. Remind me. So Del Toro. I'm just trying to remember which Pan's move. Labyrinth. Yep. Okay, that's. Yeah. Ooh. I know, right? You got to get somebody who <laughs> understands how to like humanize a monster, right? Which I will say, I also didn't like the Shape of Water, but I think you can do. Yep. He's right for it still. Mm-hmm. He understands how to do it right, and I think that him doing the Lorax would be great. Yeah. No, and I, I think for that though, yeah, I don't know if it becomes like a rated G PG. It would definitely be PG-13, but I think that's kind of what's needed. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, uh, you know, here's my thought. Like, PG-13, I feel like, yeah, there's going to be some crude, like, jarring things that happen, but that's also part of life. Uh-huh. So I feel like PG-13 is, like, that right rating that you need when you need to talk about serious things in life. Like, the Lorax, when we're talking about, like, Oh, cutting down trees and how that affects the environment. Let's do a PG-13, the Lorax. I'm on board with this. Yeah. yeah. I think that I think more people would watch it. Uh, little kids would want to grow up and be like, I want to watch the Lorax. Yes. And I think movies will be back to normal again. <laughs> I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, I would love to watch, like, have you ever read the book You're Only Old Once? That's another classic. Seuss. I have not. You're Only Old Once and Oh, The Places You'll Go. Oh, The Places You'll Go, yes. I think those make good companion pieces too. So Oh, The Places you Go, that's a classic, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that one if you've ever graduated from a place at all. Mm-hmm. Um, if you ever achieved a thing once, yeah. you know that one. You Are Only Old Once is also a great Dr. Seuss book because it is one of his only Dr. Seuss uh, picture books for adults, mm-hmm. which I read because my grandparents were very funny and had... A copy of Your Only Old Once at their house. 
Um, but it is a, a book that I think could be adapted very well by uh, somebody like a David Lynch or okay. um, somebody else. Who are some of your favorite directors? Because uh, let's go. Maybe we can reverse engineer it. Yeah. Because I feel like I keep picking people who you don't know their body of work super well. Right. So I do like Ron Howard. I think uh, I, that's well, Ron cool. Howard already did something. I know. So I'm not creative anymore. Well, what's your favorite movie? Uh, my favorite. Mo- oh, my God. Uh, what is my favorite movie? On the spot. I. You know what? It's funny. We were just talking earlier about me having an improv background, doing things on the fly. I embrace it. <laughs> this is one that I'm having such a hard time with. And it's just going to kick me in the butt right now. All right. I'm- we're going to do an improv scene. Here's what's, what's going to happen. Okay. okay. You're going to be a person who's going to a movie, and I'm going to be the ticket taker at the movie Ooh, theater. Okay? yeah. We're going to try and get you in the headspace where maybe you can be coming up with what your favorite movie is. Okay. 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 All right. Hi. Um, I am excited to watch a movie. It's, um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So – matinees uh five dollars yeah cool um we have this whole selection of movies up here that are the the favorite movies of your whole life okay which one would you like to see right now oh oh there's 10 of them there's a whole but i can't see which 10 you have (laughs) i guess the grinch is up there you seem to like this guy ron howard i don't know how i know that but i know that because the grinch is up there (laughs) anyway you gotta hurry because there's a bunch of people behind you in line you know, oh, I, I, come on, I'm trying to watch. I need to take my Xanax right now, please. No, come um, on. We're here. Do you oh have to do God. that in public? Uh, Is that gonna, does your doctor tell you you should take your Xanax in public anytime you use it as a crutch like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe you got to talk to your doctor. I need to talk to my doctor Cut again. to the doctor's office. So what happened, Whitney? Tell I me about it. I panicked at the movie theater. I'm trying to figure out what The movie memory. theater? What were you going to see? I just. I don't remember. There were 10 of them, but I blanked out because I wanted to find the favorite one. But the favorite one is for some reason. And scene. Oh, All my right. God. I think I know what it is. I think because you keep saying the favorite. Did you see the favorite? No. Oh, my God. Whitney, I was trying to give you an out. That's nah, fine. Oh, uh, well, no, that would just put me into a bigger hole because then I was like, oh, yeah, the favorite. Like, that's such a cool movie. Like That is a good movie, though. And I think oh. Yorgos Lanthimos would also make a good uh, Dr. Seuss book ad- adaptor. Yeah. He Here, could do, he yeah. could do a, Oh, the places you'll go and we'll get David Lynch to do one. Oh, you're only old once. You think it would be too much of a push if Quentin Tarantino did a, uh, Dr. Seuss movie? Not at all. What Dr. Seuss should he do though? Uh, I, I think I would love to actually, I would love to watch a Dr. Seuss, uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas that is done by, Quentin Tarantino. I can, yes. Like, re, like you do a little bit of Reservoir Dogs in it mm-hmm. to uh, to the Grinch. Yes. I think that's a ton of fun. I just realized what my favorite movie is. What is it? Monty Python, Holy Grail. Oh, well then, yeah, that's an obvious one. Terry Gilliam doing, yeah. a, doing a movie, a, a Seuss. Yeah. Oh, my God. I you don't could know totally why. pull off a Seuss. <laughs> it took me five minutes to figure out what my movie was. Whitney. I, I, so silly. I pan- you panicked so, so hard. You panicked. It was I'm, very funny to watch, though. I'm, I'm glad we got to have, have we got that on camera and we got that on audio. Yeah, that was great. Okay, so oh. we got to and by the way, we got to Quentin Tarantino, who is also still not your favorite director in your favorite movie. Well, part of the reason why is because I recently <laughs> watched a different movie and I was like, ooh, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I okay. think of I watch a different movie and I forget all of the other people who I. I ever like ever uh, um, that's how unforgiving of a person i can be <laughs> what's the what's the other movie you just watched so i recently watched uh, un, uh wait <gasps> glorious bastards oh okay and i again i think you already did an episode on i did this. yeah my i would have somebody talk about that but you didn't like that one either. i didn't like it either but i think part of it was like i don't want to say it was too violent because it's like yeah it was taken back in world war ii but I felt like some of those characters could have been like justified uh-huh. better or they didn't have to die so suddenly. Well, you know who also didn't have any justification for existing? Alec Baldwin and the Cat in the Hat. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Transition. Wonderful. Um, I think, is there any parts of this movie that are redeemable? Is there anything that you actually liked? Oh. <sighs> 
Mm. I've been trying to be more positive on the show lately, and I want to know if there's anything you liked about this dog shit pile of cat garbage. Yeah. Um, mine leading towards no right now. Okay. Uh, fair. It's I, a I, bad movie. It's a terrible movie. I mean, Alec, I'll say this. I don't think Alec Baldwin did a terrible job. I think. Really? I don't think so. I think it was just he was given. Oh. A, I think he was given words that he had to say. And I think he just had to work with it. Oh. If you're a man who is, who has to take giant globs of purple chicken fat on your body, you got to get some credit for it. I do. We have to give Alec Baldwin that credit though. Uh, yeah, I think he, he, did. he did call his here's, daughter. Here's, a pig. Yes, we did. He did. Here's what I'll say. This is a part that I don't think you liked based on the pre-interview from my lovely producer, Ben Rosen, but yeah. Um, I was actually a fan of the cooking show sequence. I think that was probably one of the better sequences in the movie. Yeah. If you took it out on its own, it is it is clearly a sketch mm-hmm. that's funny that like should not be in this movie though. Right. Okay. It shouldn't be in this movie. I remember now because yes, it felt like it was forced to make kids convert to SNL. You know? Yeah, a little bit. And I was like, ooh, this feels kind of weird. But yeah, I think that part in and of itself, I think it was kind of funny. I think there were some things that kind of just repeated itself over and over again. It just, the setup, the punchline wasn't great. But again, kids movie justifies poor. Comedy. I don't think it does, though. I mean, yeah. I will I will say this. From people who make kids movies, I think that is the justification that they often use yeah right which is like oh this is a movie for kids who fucking cares Mm -hmm. i think you should fucking care right i think there are great kids i mean even you know to your point about the uh that how to how to go how to grinch the stole christmas how to why can't i say anything today whitney it's because i'm so used to saying things when there's nobody listen i literally said that alec baldwin was gonna fuck his mom so i think we're both in the same boat here he could still fuck his mom i mean he could no one's gonna stop him no one is gonna stop him and you know what he'll probably give a pretty okay performance to it that everybody will be like wow that's a lot of gravitas to him fucking his mom oh my god (laughs) Um, but like the adaptation of how the Grinch stole Christmas, not a bad kids movie, Mm -hmm. a good family movie. Yeah. Cause I think here's what I think people have to start doing. Mm -hmm. You have to start looking at a kid's movie as a family movie. Yeah. And you, if you start making a movie that is enjoyable by the whole family Mm -hmm. and not just some random bullshit for your, for you to pop your kids in front of when you're on a long road trip or when you're at it, when your iPad battery dies, Mm -hmm then you're going to have better movies yeah. for everybody to watch. Mm-hmm. But until then, you're going to wind up continuing to make dog shit like the cat That's, in the hat. Yeah. Litter box dregs. Litter box, to say the least. Uh, I, I, I think even the CGI wasn't great either. I'm just trying to think of other movies that happened around that time, and I felt like the CGI for some of those movies were... Way better than the CGI here. Yeah, this is, um, let's see, this is 03. There's definitely some uh, some movies that happen around this time, but I can't really remember a whole lot of them. Me neither. I think we came, this is probably, also I'm going to blame 9-11 for this movie. I yeah. think 9-11 yeah. has a part in all the movies that exist immediately after it, mm-hmm. and I think that people were like, well, we're just going to make some wacky, wacky Mike Myers having goofs in a cat suit. Sitch and uh, bad call, very bad call. Would rather have watched nine eleven happen again than watch this movie again. E. Whitney didn't want to agree with me on that one, but uh. she did in her mind. I saw it happen, folks. <laughs> you heard it here first. Oh. If you're watching on YouTube, you saw the eye contact that she made with her own soul. Part of it was like, "Well, you're not wrong." <laughs> See, and that is a great place to end a podcast. Um, <sighs> Whitney. This has been a pleasure. Where can the listeners find you on social media if they want to follow you and see what other movies you can never remember liking? Oh, oh here's my panic attack. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so pretty much people can find me on Instagram. I do have a Twitter. Um, and, yep, yeah, Facebook. And don't worry about Facebook. But my Instagram and Twitter both have the handle at Waddles Barkley. At Waddles Barkley, so, very easy to find. W A T T L E S. Yeah. 
And you, it's uh yeah, you can you can look uh do you have any uh, uh you've got chaotic roll coming up soon too, right? I was supposed to have it today and we had to cancel it, so we're taking the month off. Well, it'll be back. It will be back. A fun D and D uh D and D flavored show. Mm-hmm. You should go check it out if you like some D and D type type of stuff. Yeah. Um you can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates and stuff. Um don't watch Cat in the Hat. Don't, ever. don't watch. Don't it. do it. I I have a feeling that people aren't going to reach out to me and disagree with me on this. If so. anybody does, please let me know. I will forward them over to you and be and like, check this person out. Like, yeah, <laughs> I would be shocked. Yeah. Um, but thanks again, Whitney. Thank you. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. Oh, 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 oh.